And if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn in it with me <clears throat> to uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 4, and verses 21 to 25. John 4, 21. And uh, we're in part 7 of our current series called The Church at Work. Heartfelt, truthful worship is our uh, topic today. When I was a, a youth and worship pastor, fresh out of college, know it all that I was, which is still dying, it's dying a slow and painful death, me being a know-it-all. Um, and um, I even said that pretty certainly, actually, that's just to prove that it's still there. But, uh, but when I, anyway, when I was a youth and worship pastor, the pastor who hired me uh, told me that I was going to be over the two most um, touching ministries uh, of any local church, uh, the kids and the music. Of course, everybody loves the next generation, at least they should. Uh, and so it's touching, you know, to work with the kids. And, um, and music is obviously very important to a lot of people. You know, people are emotional about the music. And I just have to share this, and I debated whether or not I'm going to, and I'm probably going to still be debating with myself this afternoon if I should or not. But a couple years ago, we, uh, we did a church-wide questionnaire uh, on the different categories of uh, the church's uh, life, the uh, categories actually that make up this series that we're in. And um, one person anonymously, actually, during the, uh, the questionnaire, uh, had a lot of very, I'll just say, emotional comments uh, about the, uh, the lack of music and, uh, and what's wrong, uh, really, with how we, uh, how we do music as a church now. And uh, what that did was that showed me um, that, yeah, people are emotional about music. People care deeply about the uh, music in the church. And so... Today, uh, as we're in part seven of uh, this series of uh, trying to figure out really what a healthy church is, we talk about how Jesus intends for his church to worship, uh, how, the, how he intends for the church to worship him, which is good, because otherwise we would just be speculating, hoping to get it right, not really sure if we are. So I'm going to start off here by reading John 4, <clears throat> 21 to 25, and uh, this is going to give us the... Uh, it's going to set up our first category here of three, a first heading, I should say, of three headings. But John 4, 21, Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman. He says, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. It's a word of the Lord for us today, and we're glad. We find here in these words, the spirit of redeemed worship. That's our first heading, the spirit of redeemed worship. Famously, Jesus had just told the Samaritan woman of all of her sins and of uh, the character of her life as something less than godly. And uh, she picks up and perceives that he's a prophet because he knows these things about her without her having told him any of these kind of things. And so being a prophet, he must be a Jew as well. She's a Samaritan, he's a Jew. And so that's why she says there uh, that you say that worship is supposed to happen in Jerusalem. We say that it's supposed to happen here uh, in this uh, area of uh, Samaria there in verse uh, verse 20. And so... so to her kind of uh, immature territorial understanding of worship, where you say this, we say that, and let's just kind of leave it at that and, uh, and be peaceful about it. Jesus responds by telling her in verse 23 that the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Worship is not supposed to be something, Jesus says, that happens here or there but it happens in truth, as people know the truth, and they bask in it, and they appreciate it, and they let it guide and direct their lives. That's worship. That's what it's supposed to be. And back of this idea is the idea that because God's redeemed presence, 
promised in the Old Testament is fulfilled now that Jesus has come into the world, the temple goes from being in one place to becoming atomized throughout all the world wherever there are believers. That's why the temple fell 40 years after Jesus left, because it wasn't needed anymore, because the people of God are the temple. And if you need evidence of this, all you have to do is consider that Jesus says later in John 7, whoever believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living what? Water. You know what that is? That's Ezekiel 47 in the Old Testament, saying that a stream of water is going to flow out from the door of the temple. Jesus is saying the people of God become the temple. And so now, because of this, worship is a way of life. It's not a festival or a day. It's a way of life. It, and this sets up what I think are our two most important points about worship that I want you to see here. First, in the second part of verse 23, Jesus says that the Father seeks such people, that is to say, true worshipers. There in verse 23, true worshipers worship him this way. That is to say, first, that worship is sincere. It's true. It's meant. It's not feigned. People worship him because they want to worship him. They realize that he's worth it. And secondly, we find here, because he says in verse 24 that God is spirit and so he must be worshipped spiritually, that is to say it's not here or there, but it is for who he is, which means that worship is also theologically clear. Worship is sincere. Worship is clear. Now, alliteration is one of the pastor's best tools. That was not meant to rhyme, actually, sincere and clear. It just so happened to be the case that indeed those two words do rhyme. Worship is sincere and worship is clear. This means that you don't go to a church building or to a conference or, and I don't want to step on anybody's toes here because I know how many outdoors people we have here, you don't have to go out to the woods to meet with God. You might go to those places to find quietness of heart and quietness of soul, and guess what? That's a beautiful thing. God gives that to us as a blessing. But God is no more here than he is there. The Spirit of God is everywhere. Psalm 139, Christ fills all things, Ephesians says. Everywhere that Christ, everything that Christ owns, his presence is there in some way or another. And so Jesus is telling this woman, you've got to repent of this speculation, this ignorance that you have, and of this religiosity that you have, and learn that you are supposed to become the temple of God, or else you're missing the point of the Messiah coming. So the woman responds, as we would expect her as somebody who's trying to kind of wiggle off the conviction hook. Uh, she responds the way that we would probably expect there in verse 25 when she says, well, when the Messiah comes, he'll tell us all the truth and then we'll figure things out then. She's right to expect this because the Messiah was promised to come as one who would uh, have all the nations come and seek the truth from him in Isaiah 11. But Jesus then responds there in verse 26, telling her, right now, me talking to you, that's me. I'm the Messiah who is telling you all things that you need to know. He brought such clarity to things. His truth is life-giving truth. And let me just put it this way. Um, if you are hoping that one day you can ask Jesus a bunch of questions and that, that will finally put, you, put your spirit to rest, knowing the answer to certain things... Um, that might not be a bad thing. I think we all have questions that we would like to have answered. I just wonder if perhaps uh, our hearts aren't at the rest yet that the Lord really wants us to have today, where we realize that he has given us clarity. He's given us the truth that we need to know, and he's truly made us um, clear on that which we, we need for this day. My point is, if... Doctrine doesn't excite you, nothing will. And I think that part of the conversion process for a lot of folks today, maybe even back in that day, but especially today, is waking up to realizing just how messed up your tastes are for things that are interesting. We tend to be indifferent towards God, but excited about other things. You guys know this. I love music. I love, I love sports. 
If left to myself, those things would just take up all of my attention all the time. And over time, the Lord has shown me these things are so stupid, actually, compared to the real things that matter. It's not that they're bad in and of themselves. It's just they, they tend to create within you this sort of thing where, like, I have to fit into that category for you, Scott, in order for you to be excited. And I think that for most of us, we've got to get to a place where we realize I'm bored with God because I'm excited about the things of the world. And that's got to stop. And Jesus is here saying, I have come to you to bring you the absolute truth and absolute clarity about what is true so that you will know what you're supposed to be excited about. So redeemed worship, I'm trying to say, is sincere and is clear on God as people are the temple of God. The prophets, in the prophets in the Old Testament, God said, they will all know me. They will all obey my commands. They will tell of my deeds. The people of God are going to be clear on him, and they will be sincere in their pursuit of him. Vagueness and fakeness exists. Let's be clear about that. It's just that it's pre-Christ. It's not true Christianity. There's no such thing as fakeness in the faith or vagueness in the faith. The Lord gives us clarity, and he wants our worship to be real. We want to be a people who have truly, who have truly found Jesus and live as though we do. And I have to share this with you. Um, I was in class one time in my undergrad. This is many years ago. This is probably, I'm trying to think how long ago this was, almost 20 years, but not quite. And uh, we were in, a, in class discussing, and this is kind of a mixed, a mixed crowd, different ethnicities and all that. And we were discussing um, the differences between um, different, uh, different churches from different traditions and all of that. And um, there were a couple of black pastors in there, and most of us were, uh, were white folks. And uh, we were talking about what the differences between the churches were. And uh, this black pastor uh, spoke up, and he said, well, here's the primary difference. Here's why, uh, here's why your churches are so, uh, are so bored and our churches are so energetic. It's because black churches have found Jesus, and white churches are still trying to find him. <laughs> <laughs> we all, we all, like you, you responded very uncomfortably just then. We all busted up laughing. It was so funny. Um, and uh, I just remember sitting back at my, you know, in my, uh, around the age of 20 and thinking to myself, point taken. <laughs> point taken. Not sure if I would simplify it that much, but, uh, but uh, point taken. My, it's just kind of stuck with me. Does our church life betray that we have truly found Jesus? Or does it seem like we're still kind of hoping to find him? And, uh, and um, getting to that place where we know, uh, instead of knowing that he's truly among us, we're his temple. Okay, so that being said, that's the first thing, the spirit of redeemed worship. Um, the second heading here is the purpose of the redeemed worship gathering. The purpose of the redeemed worship gathering. I want you to turn with me over to first. Corinthians chapter 14, 1 Corinthians 14, and um, <clears throat> from early on in the early church, these clear and sincere Christians that Jesus is working to produce were meeting with each other for teaching, for fellowship, for prayer, for the breaking of bread. Acts 2, you can read about that. As time went along, these churches were organized, Acts 6, with leaders, people who served tables, all of that so that they could then live as light wherever God had them uh, planted. And eventually there were criteria, if you read 1 Timothy 3, for deciding who should be leading these gatherings, who should be leading the family of God in these local gatherings to be light. And so Paul here in 1 Corinthians, he writes this letter um, to this, uh, uh, to this uh, church, this group of leaders here to try to show them what should govern their worship gathering together. There's a lot of interesting teaching here on what flies for Christian worship. Obviously, Christian worship is to be sincere and clear, because that's the nature of it. But Paul here goes even further in describing what the worship gathering is supposed to be like. And I just want to I just want you to look at verse 26 and following, because there, there's a lot of really good teaching here about how this should be governed under one primary heading. Look at verse 26. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. How is it, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you as a psalm or a hymn, 
has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. He says, let all things be done for edification. Somebody give me a different translation. Let all things be done for building up. Build, strengthening the church? Oh, very good, very good, very good. Um, primarily, ultimately, the idea here, building up. The worship gathering is for the purpose of building up and strengthening the people of God. It is not about a particular aesthetic, having an older church, having a newer, fresher church, but it is about strengthening up the faith and the doctrine of believers. Remember, who are we? We're, we are supposed to be a sincere and clear people. The gathering is supposed to build that sincerity and that clarity about God. This is actually ubiquitous throughout this whole section of 1 Corinthians that the church is supposed to be about building up the faith. Think about it. The church is the house of God being, being built up still today. Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church all through the world is what he's talking about. And so we gather so that we will be built up as the, uh, as the church, as the people of God. So that being said, that being said, um, under that heading of building up, uh, Paul adds here also that the church therefore must be well led and ordered. There in verse 26. You come together, each one has a psalm, a teaching, a tongue, a revelation, an interpretation. You look at this and some people I've heard over the years say, well, this must mean that we're all supposed to sit around in a circle when we meet together and everybody can share something that is on their heart. Everybody can bring a song, everybody can bring an interpretation, and it's all going to be good. we got to get away from this whole idea of one person standing up to preach. Um, this, is, this is just men trying to exercise power over other people. We need to sit around in a circle, and we need to have each person bringing something. Doesn't it mean everyone, Pastor? No. Here's why. If you look in verse 34... Half of the church is excluded from the each of verse 26. You know why I say that? Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they're not permitted to speak, but to be submissive as the law also says. Now, this was clearly not written by somebody in the 21st century. Um, <laughs> um, but the point couldn't be clearer. This is something that is primarily a, a male responsibility in the local church. And... This means that whoever he is writing, whoever Paul is talking to about leading the church, it doesn't just mean everybody, because that's half of the church excluded right there from this responsibility to lead. That's the women. But furthermore, furthermore, in Acts 13:1, you find that the church in Antioch, which was one of the biggest churches uh, in, you know, in the world then and in the world for a long time, actually, after that, there were five leaders who were singled out as the leaders of the church in Antioch. And so it seems like it was a handful of people who were supposed to lead this church. And it seems to me that that's who Paul is talking to right here. A handful of leaders who stand up. One person leads a psalm. One person gives a teaching. One person early on here can still speak in a tongue. Uh, one person has a revelation because prophecy is still in the scriptures, not finished yet. It's a team of leaders who preside over the service. The reason why it's got to be ordered this way is because everybody can talk. Not everybody can build up. A lot of people talk to try to build themselves up. But only some are called to talk to try to build other people up. And so it can't just be everybody. It's got to be well-led, ordered, and structured. You say, Pastor, you are not allowed to just sort of throw that no women grenade out there and then just kind of move on without talking about it and explaining it even more. Isn't there no male or female, no Jew or Greek? Galatians 3 talks about that. Indeed, absolutely. But my thought is this, you don't get to absolutize verses about how there's neither male nor female, Jew or Gentile, et cetera, et cetera, and then atomize these verses. Gender doesn't matter for value in God's eyes. Gender does matter for spiritual responsibilities in the church. 
You see the difference? Nobody's better than anybody else. Paul's very clear on this in the New Testament. Men need women, women need men. We can't live without each other. Quite literally, we can't live without each other. Everybody matters the same. It's just that men have a primary responsibility to be new Adams in the new creation, work that God is doing to establish the gospel in the world. It's not just that God said it, I believe it, that settles it, although that should be enough, but it's because it's a new creation thing. And how, it, how else is the new creation supposed to be seen than first men standing up and taking responsibility to lead the people of God? Not as a way of domineering, but as a way of saying, this is what we do um, to try to be the first to serve. That's what this is about. And so, and I always, I'm always a little hesitant and apprehensive to go this route because I don't like to name names of people I'm criticizing. I just, I don't think it's usually wise. Um, but, but I'm going to do it today. Um, when I hear folks talk about how, well, how can you deny that the Beth Moores and the Joyce Myerses aren't gifted? Listen to them speak. Aren't they gifted to preach? And my response is, oh, they're gifted to speak. They're incredibly gifted. Both of those women are better public speakers than I am, I think but they're not called to the pulpit. Um, At least for now, I am. And uh, the reason why I know that is not because I say it, it's because the scripture couldn't be more clear on this. They're sinning, and they need to repent. This is something that is for the sake, not of being combative, pugnacious, chauvinistic, puritanical, although it will be seen that way by some, but it's for the sake of peace and order in the church. Look in verse 33. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, right after which he talks about women keeping silent in the churches. This is about peace, things functioning the way that they were supposed to in Eden. They're supposed to function now that way, even in a better way even greater because Christ has come to make a new creation. You might also then respond, well, how can you say that the church is supposed to be ordered? Because it does say, um, I mean, don't we know that the spirit of God is going to lead the churches? Um, I've heard it said before that because I'm such a stickler for order and structure in churches that that that's quenching the spirit. Uh, Because don't we trust that the spirit's just going to make everything work together? My thought is, of course, we should trust that, and it starts by listening to the book that he wrote. Because if what you think we should do is, you say, is driven by the Spirit leading you, and it's in contradiction with what we know that the Spirit said in the Scriptures, somebody here is wrong, and it's not the Bible. We have to start by, we have to start by letting what he inspired and what he wrote guide us and direct us. When there is order in the church, the focus is going to be on the word. When there's confusion in the church, combativeness, et cetera, et cetera, the focus is going to be on winning. And I think you know which one glorifies the Lord the most. So uh, thirdly here, to build up, worship has also got to be simple. Look in verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order, decently and in order. I've been in so many services over the years where there's so much going on. How they fit these worship services within a two-hour time frame, I don't know. By the way, if you're a visitor, we're not going to be here two hours, I promise. Uh, at least I don't think. But, um, but they're, they're, so, they're, trying to, they're trying to kind of shoehorn this part of the service in and that part of the service, all to, it seems like, probably to keep people happy and all those kind of things. It's all about an aesthetic, church feeling a certain way, not about building up faith. By the way, this is why I left worship ministry um, to, uh, to begin to preach at, at way too young of an age. Um, and uh, I would not encourage any young men to go the way that I went. I would say, I would say, wait, please, you know, 
grow more and, uh, and uh, take your time. But I left worship ministry uh, really not because I don't love worship. I do. I love music and I love playing and um, love singing and all, and all this kind of stuff. I just got tired of the show because the whole like worship culture and churches in America, it is a show. It's fake. It's a farce by nature. Not for everybody, of course, like a lot of people are sincere in what they're doing. I just think that the effect of what they're doing ends up taking the focus off of God and onto them. At least it was with me. It takes the focus away from real ministry. Finally here, uh, under this heading, before I move into the third and final heading, um, since worship is therefore also public, not private, but public, it should be evangelistically sensible. Look in verses 24 and 25 of 1 Corinthians 14. But if all prophesy, that is to say in that context, if all speak in a way that people can understand, and an unbeliever, an uninformed person comes in, he's convinced by all, he's convicted by all, the secrets of his heart are revealed, and so falling on his face, he'll worship God and report that God is truly among you. That is to say, we at the very least want to have an eye towards that which might communicate effectively to non-believers or people who maybe haven't been to a church like ours or to church in a while. We're not trying to cater to fleshly sensibilities. We're not like having a band who's starting off service by playing ACDC's Highway to Hell just because that's going to reach lost people. This happens, by the way. Um, but we're, we're not going to try to cater to fleshly sensibilities, but we do want to, like Paul says, give thought to what's honorable in the sight of all people. Is it clear what we're doing? The songs that we're singing, are they beautiful? Is the message we're preaching clear? What are our expectations for folks when they come, when they come in? Do they, do they feel like they're, they're being judged? How do we treat people when they come in? We try to make them feel welcome and feel at home, all these kind of things. We want to be sensible to those who come in because our job is to be light, right? Okay, so we've talked about the spirit of redeemed worship. It is sincere and clear. We've talked about the purpose of the redeemed worship gathering. We build up through simplicity, through clarity and joy. Finally here, third heading, the tune of redeemed worship. Turn to Revelation 4, if you will. This is the last passage we'll look at today. I do apologize. This is more of like a Bible study perhaps than a traditional message, but um, just feel like there are things we need to look at. The tune of redeemed worship. I just want to draw your attention to one little thing that keeps getting repeated. As John the Apostle sees heavenly worship in Revelation 4 and 5, you're going to see something here because I'm going to point it out to you. Revelation 4, 8, all these living creatures with six wings full of eyes around and within, it all seems to be figurative. They don't rest day or night saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Skip down to verse 10 there. Talking about the 24 elders falling down before him who sits on the throne. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Skip down to chapter 5. I'm just going to look at one or two more here. Chapter 5, after the Lamb comes out, Christ comes out. They have a harp, golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain. I could say more, but let me just, I think you get, maybe you see the word that is in common every time there. Worship is spoken. Saying keeps being repeated. 4 8, 4 10, 5 9, 5 12, 5 13, 5 14. Worship is spoken. It's words saying to God. People worship God by words. You might remember when Jesus and the disciples left the Lord's Supper that last night, what were they doing as they left? They were singing together, weren't they? And when Paul and Barnabas were in jail in Philippi, what were they doing when the jail cell opened up? Singing hymns. And what were, the, what were the other prisoners doing? They were listening. 
They probably hadn't heard music in a long time. The people of God sing because God is sung to in eternity, gloriously. We love the Lord, we know him, so we join in with the angels in singing to him. And because of this, I'm just going to put my cards out on the table here. Because of this, instrumentation in the local church's worship is supposed to be assistant to the voices of the people of God and therefore simple. Um, there's another book in Pastor's Picks uh, back there by uh, Peter Masters, who is the uh, pastor of Met Tab in London for 54 years, since 1970. He's still, been, he's still there. Just remarkable to me um, how long uh, these pastors like him and Dr. MacArthur have been pastoring. It's just really incredible. But um, he's got a book that, that the deacons and I read together a couple years ago called Worship or Entertainment. And he makes the case that if you really look at the Old Testament temple worship, the instrumentation is actually pretty simple. There are only a few categories of instruments that are used. It wasn't like this massive orchestra like what we expect, but there are really just a couple of, a couple of categories of instruments. Not one or two, but uh, of instruments. You know, there were several, but it was actually pretty tempered compared to what we usually think. He also talks in the book about how in the Psalms, most of the time when instruments come up, the context is festival or battle, or sometimes instrumentation is figurative. And I think that's what's happening in Psalm 150, what we started with in our call to worship. Because he says, praise him with the symbols, praise him with this, praise him with that, and then it says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Do you know what has breath in the Old Testament? Humans, only humans. Even animals don't have breath in the sense that it means. But the breath of God is something that he has that he gives to people. Point is this. Instrumentation in corporate worship is to assist the singing of the people of God, which is the real worship that the Lord looks for. Instruments at the end of the day don't really worship God but they assist the people of God as they worship God in sincerity and clarity because they are his house in which he dwells. And so the tune of redeemed worship here, the third heading, is voices singing, instruments helping. Voices singing, instruments helping. And if I could just get a, a kind of just get on the ground here with you uh, about what this means practically. Instrumentation and corporate worship gathering. When I say corporate worship, I don't mean like, you know, in an office somewhere. What I mean is what we're doing right now. This is corporate worship. There should probably be maybe a couple of instruments at most. Whatever it is that's going to help our voices sing. Um, you know, we can have a couple, maybe two or three. But if you get kind of beyond that, it might start becoming about the music more than it's about the singing. Thinking also about skill. Um, should we have the very best of the best playing and assisting this, the voices? Sure, if we can, but it's not, a, it's not a performance. Worship playing is not a performance. It's also not a distraction either. It shouldn't be. Because we could also have some very poor musicians playing in such a way that it becomes a distraction and we can't focus on the songs. We want to just do whatever it is that we can to help the people of God sing. The style of worship should be congregational. The types of songs that we sing should be hymns, newer songs. By the way, I've just got a little, uh, just, a, just a little like, kind of like personal axe to grind. Um, <clears throat> and I, th this is me criticizing myself. So like I'm, I'm, over, I'm over this. But this says praise and worship on it, the booklet, and the hymnal says hymns on it. And um, it almost, it makes it seem like, well, these are the praise and worship songs. Those are the hymns. And that's different. The reality is there are hymns in here, and there are songs that are categorized as praise and worship songs in there as well. It's all the same thing. Any song that is singable, that preaches the gospel, that make the people of God join in with the heavenly chorus is a hymn. It's a praise song. 
whatever it is that can build up the faith and can be sung. I just, it seems to me like there are so many dangers with kind of overproduction in the local church in worship. I, I, and I think it's driven by a fairly unique, a uniquely American uh, religious phenomenon called revivalism. And revivalism is something that stems from the Second Great Awakening, right, like post-revolution, a couple centuries, a few centuries ago, uh, where essentially, if I could simplify it, revivalism says that, that when the church gathers, it is more about the experience of worship than it's about the truth. Um, and really, from the revivals back then, it was all about this big-time experience and people crying and this the minister yelling and getting emotional and hellfire and brimstone and making people fall down and faint and all of that. Book after book has been written on this. Ian Murray, Nathan Hatch, who was the president of um, Wake Forest University for many years, wrote about this as well. Thomas Sowell even wrote about this too. I just think that the danger of overproduction at the, at the attempt to try to produce some kind of feeling or some kind of experience takes the focus off of God and it de-emphasizes real ministry because it's going to become all about the production. It's not going to become about really walking with Christ and trying to shine light to people. Does it matter whether we use guitar or piano? piano well? It doesn't matter as much as the songs. I know that, uh, I know that there are at least a few who... Um, uh, are uh, are just patiently waiting until uh, Suzanne is available to come back from recovering from surgery to the piano um, because it's easier to sing with that than it is with, uh, with my playing guitar. We're going to have uh, some other accompanists coming soon. Beth's going to play piano for us one Sunday. Wilma's going to be here playing organ another Sunday. Um, I just would say the main thing is not what instrument is being played. It's the voices. It's the singing. Finally, let me just share what got me in trouble a couple years ago with a, with a few people in the church. Is special music appropriate in a local church? Isn't it the case that we should have a venue for people to be able to show their giftedness, their musicianship, their ability to sing, their ability to play? Musicianship is not a spiritual gift. It's a gift, but it's not a spiritual gift. Service is not a venue for people to exhibit their gifts. Worship is a place where we're supposed to come and give God all the glory. Take the attention off of ourselves and focus on him entirely. I know that you might disagree with me on that, but you're wrong. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. You might disagree with me on that, and that's okay. But the fact of the matter is, when we worship, you better believe that it's not about us, but it's about him. From the very beginning, the God who spoke the word to create and then to redeem us is worshiped by words from those who are redeemed. And so three questions quickly here as I'm closing that we ask as a church and that, uh, um, that the elders uh, are, uh, that we think through about our worship life. Three questions. Number one, is our worship real? Is our worship real? Does it come from a living faith? Are you walking with the Lord Monday to Saturday so that Sunday is an extension of that? Or are you living in sin the rest of the time and then just faking it on Sundays? If so, it's not real. The devil is always going to attack church. He's always going to give you every possible distraction to take away your ability to enjoy the Lord's day. It's always going to be that case. But when you're here, are you happy to be here? Can you rejoice, can you um, quote Psalm 84.10 or at least uh, echo what he says, you know, how joyful it is to dwell in the courts of the Lord. Better is one day there than what? A thousand elsewhere. Secondly, does our song selection preach and teach the gospel? Or are they just our favorite songs that we like to sing? This is why teaching matters so much. We've got to be able to discern whether a song is a good song for us to sing as a church. I heard John MacArthur say this one time, it's just a beautiful quote, I've never forgotten it. Your worship in church will never be high unless you take your people deep. We've got to go deep. 
We've got to be able to think clearly about whether it really glorifies the Lord and helps us to sing. And thirdly here and finally, does our style promote congregational singing? Do we sing songs that are objectively hard? Or do we sing songs that sometimes because they're new, they're hard to sing, but if we practice, it'll get better? This is part of the reason why we don't sing the song The First Noel at Christmas time. It's not because it's not a beautiful song. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. It's just that it's really hard to sing because it's got like single syllable words spread out over like five notes and, uh, and nobody can keep, can keep up with it. We can also become nitpickers without realizing it. Picking apart, oh, I can't sing along with that song very well, therefore I don't like it. Can't sing along with that instrument accompanying, therefore I don't really like it. Ultimately, we've got to always think with the criteria of what's going to help us to sing, what's going to really help us to worship, to lift our voices, to truly sing. The best worship services are the services where the people are singing to God who are living for God. You can tell when you're in that place. You say, well, what if we're a timid, more quiet people? That's fine. I'm not asking you to become Luciano Pavarotti when you come to church. You can tell sincerity. You can tell gospel clarity. You can tell that God's house is being built up among a people who say to him and to one another in their singing his great glory that is worthy of all of our attention and all of our affection. You can just tell when you're there. And I hope that when people visit First Baptist that they can tell that's the case here too. I've talked way long enough. Let's pray. So, Father, um, it can be combative to say that there are right ways to worship and wrong ways to worship. It can at least feel combative. I just pray that our hearts would always be focused on meeting with the Lord and living with the Lord. And as we come to the worship gathering, come to build each other up, to truly promote faith, to make the Lord um, more believable to each other, and to make his presence more palpable. And Father, I pray uh, that when we meet, that it wouldn't be about us, because as we're living our lives, we're so secure that Christ keeps, sustains, and shepherds us that it doesn't have to be about us. But it's all about him entirely. Make that the case, O oh Lord, we pray. Shepherd us, and may we be a ministry here on this corner as we have for centuries now. By your grace, among whom, if the Lord returns, he will find faith. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.